I'm Taryn Bow. I'm the Associate Director at Maine Writers and Publishers Alliance. Um, if you're not familiar with MWPA and what we do, we are a small literary arts nonprofit in Portland, and um, our mission is to create educational and scholarship opportunities for writers, and also um, connect and, and promote writers within Maine and bring great writers like these guys to our area for conversations like we're gonna have tonight. Um, tonight we're co-hosting this event with print. These guys have been so awesome during the pandemic and getting books out into people's hands. And you can order all of the books we're gonna talk about tonight there. Um, we'll send out a link to their website where you can find these. Um, all right, I'm gonna just do some brief introductions, like I said, and then we'll get started. But basically I am so excited to have these three writers here tonight. I don't know if any, if they know this, but, <laughs> and I'm sure I'm not alone in this either, but these, like I have been looking forward to their books or anticipating books that will come out in the future for all of the pandemic beginning in March um, was when I think I started tracking what books are coming out. So like that could be my one thing to look forward to on the horizon. And I knew Laura's was gonna come out in July and Danielle's was gonna come out in November and Farah had a book that was gonna come out um, through New Rivers Press in the fall. And that's been postponed because of, um, you know, just financial instability at that publishing house. But that's something to look forward to in the future. Um, at any rate, I knew from reading their stories that they've already written that their new work would surprise, challenge, move, and entertain me as a reader. But I also knew that as a writer, these stories would really push me to reimagine what is possible with the short story form, to take more risks, to look more clearly, to write more imaginatively and authentically about situations, people, and dynamics in the world that really matter and have substantial weight. Um, so with that, I'm going to read brief bios for these folks and then we'll dive right in. Um, Danielle Evans is the author of the short story collection, The Office of Historical Corrections. And before you suffocate your own full self, winner of the Pen American Pen Robert W. Bingham Prize, the Hurston Wright Legacy Award and the Patterson Prize and a National Book Foundation 5 Under 35 selection. Her stories have appeared in many magazines and anthologies, including the Best American Short Stories multiple times. Um, she teaches in the writing seminars at John Hopkins University. Laura Vanderberg's most recent book is The Short Story Collection I Hold a Wolf by the Ears. Other works of hers include the novel, The Third Hotel, and two other collections, The Isle of Youth and What the World Will Look Like When All the Water Leaves Us, as well as the novel, Find Me. Her stories have been anthologized in the Best American Short Stories, the Best American Mystery Stories, the O. Henry Prize Stories, and the Best American Non-Required Reading Series. Farah Ali is from Pakistan. Her work has been anthologized in the 2020 Pushcart Prize, as well as received well, special mention in the 2018 Pushcart Anthology. Her stories can be found in Shenandoah, the Arkansas International, the Southern Review, Kenyan Review Online, Copper Nickel, and others. So thanks, welcome these guys. We're so glad to have them here. Um, all right, I'm going to start off with a pretty basic question, but this is a night of fierce and fabulous short story writers, so um, this seems like a suitable place to start. Why do you guys return to this form, the form of the short story? Um, what does the form offer the reader that maybe other forms don't, and what does it offer the writer? Um, what is unique and special about this form for you all? Any of you can start. <laughs> I could, I could start. Um, I so I think in some ways, like my reasons for returning to the short story are actually super personal. Um, it was the first form of fiction that I ever fell in love, or the first form of not just fiction but literature that I ever fell in love with. Um, and I really wasn't a reader uh, until I started reading short stories in college, and I fell 
so completely in love with the story that um, it really, I mean, it's, it's not a, an, an overstatement to say that the short story changed my life. Um, and it wasn't until I became a reader, thanks to the mighty short story, that it became possible for me to um, even entertain ideas or imagine myself as a writer. So I, I, owe, I, owe, the sh I owe the short story everything. Um, and so for those reasons, um, for me, it's really hard to imagine a creative practice without the short story being, you know, like fairly central um, to it and in it. Um, from a sort of readerly perspective, I mean, I think like what the story does that's really special is that like because of the the compression and the natural intensity that the compression brings, it's like putting a, like a kind of like a grain of sand under a microscope where it can take a familiar thing and magnify it to such a degree that we're able to see the world um, in new ways. I think the I think the compression of the form, you know, for writers who maybe like aren't used to working within a, sh a more compact frame that can feel like a constraint, but I actually find a lot of freedom um, in the more co compressed space and a lot of sort of um, flexibility in some ways. And I also like, I think short stories have very different relationships speaking broadly to kind of like resolution um, versus novels. like feel like, I mean, there are plenty of novels that end, end, end in a, my dog agrees, um, <laughs> plenty of novels that end in a sort of unresolved space, but I love the way the short story, you know, sometimes there's this feeling of like, we begin on a cliff's edge and then we kind of travel and we end on a cliff's edge, but it's a different cliff's edge than the one that we started on. Um, and I think it's a demanding form in that way for readers, right? Like it often leaves us sort of in a, in a deeper space of ambiguity. Um, it often like doesn't, you know, answer as many questions as it poses um, and leaves us in a, in a sort of unsettled space. Um, and certainly again, not all stories do that, but I, I do think that um, it's a demanding form to write in, but it's also a demanding form to, to read in because there is, there's kind of does tend to be more air, um, but I, as a reader, like love that about the story. Yeah, I think I also find this short story to be flexible and dynamic. Um, one of the things I really love about a story collection is that you often get to see a writer look at the same question and answer it again and again and answer it in a different way every time. And I like that as a reader. I like the way that it's sort of reading is always, I think, a conversational process that you as the writer are offering the subject, you're offering some of the questions, you're offering the frame, but the reader always has to meet you in the conversation somewhere. And I think this short story and especially the collection forum allows you to kind of complicate that conversation um, by coming at it from different angles, by asking the same question and arriving at different conclusions. And so I enjoy that as a reader and I like the freedom it gives me as a writer to consider something knowing that I can reconsider it um, in the same text. And I also really, I think I, I also talk a lot about compression in the story form. I think especially like the compression of time, right? That it's sometimes not a form that gives you a lot of space in the present, but because of its compression at any moment in the present of a story, you can almost always gesture toward or actually access the past or the future. And it feels to me, um, like being alive feels, right? Where we're always in some moment and we're also always haunted by something and we're also always kind of imagining, um, maybe I'm just describing anxiety and not the short story. <laughs> but, um, we're always imagining or wondering what happens next. <laughs> but, but I do think, and maybe that's why I love the short story form, that it's sort of, um, I think that that being present in all the planes of time at once feels to me like how feeling alive feels. And so I like trying to get that on the page. Yeah, I came to short stories the opposite way from Laura. Um, mine was always reading big novels and I read short stories much later. So I always attempted a novel first, you know, but when I read short stories, it was life changing. And I fell in love with the way that you can go, you can cover a lot of time and a lot of space in a very short, you know, um, you know in as few pages as possible. I love writing them because it's, it's a massive challenge to sustain that mood um, over a very few pages versus a novel, which I have also attempted. But, you know, um, yeah, I think a short story can do the thing of a gut punch that a novel won't be able to do, maybe. Awesome, thanks you guys. Um, 
I think folks are always really interested in process too, of like how a collection comes together and, you know, um, were they just the stories that you wrote all in a row or were you thinking or even obsessing about certain ideas and themes when a certain kind of group of stories came together? Um, so thinking about your most recent collections, what did the process look like for, for bringing those stories together? Like how long did it take? Were there particular ideas that you were obsessed with while writing these pieces? Were there any obstacles to bringing this collection together? The obstacle for me was that I was pretending to write a novel. So I kept sort of secretly, furtively writing short stories and then hiding them. <laughs> so um, it took me years to acknowledge that I had written a story collection. And I think in some ways, in some ways, yes, that was a slow process. In other ways, I think it was actually a really healthy process because I wasn't sitting there looking at one story and saying, okay, what do I need next? And I think that often the best collections come from an organic kind of emergence of a theme in what you've already written, that you write a bunch of things you're excited about and then you start to see the conversation as opposed to trying to decide like, I'm gonna write eight stories and like this will be the eight topics that um, because I was just working on one thing at a time and working very slowly on one thing at a time and like working on them with gaps in between um, that the work emerged when I'd already written more than half the book. And I had made up all of these reasons because I also have a day job in academia and you have to constantly tell them what you're doing. Um, I had made up all of these things that I thought were the conversation in the book. Um, and they were all like wildly wrong. And I, at one point I said, oh, all of these stories are in present tense. And I said that for like a year. And then I reread the stories and I was like, this one's not in present tense. The thing I'm working on now, I don't want to put in present tense because I committed to this project. So I had to keep sort of changing what I was actually committed to. And then I realized sort of very clearly that there had been this theme of, of correction, of apology, of kind of corrections of the record. And I didn't realize it until I wrote um, the second to last story for the collection, which was at that point, the one that was most clearly focused on that question. And I was like, oh, this is what all of these stories have in common. And then the last thing in the, I wrote for the book is actually a novella that did borrow from the novel that I've been working on, but that also I wrote with this understanding of, oh, this is gonna be the most direct expression of the question I've been asking over and over again in more subtle ways in this other work. Um, so it was kind of waiting to see the shape of the book revealed and then finishing it and revising it with that shape in mind. I have a right, so, you know, I wrote my collection, the stuff that I wrote, it wasn't with the aim to make a collection, but because I hadn't written for a long time, and when I did write, everything came out in like three years. <laughs> so it was stuff that had been here for a long time, all my life. And when I read it over it later, it, there were things that popped up re repeatedly, like, um, you know, the idea of how my, my focus always seems to be on how two people react to changes that they've been dealing with um, for years. So kind of like, you know, how tectonic plates move over thousands of years, but something has to give eventually. So in my stories, it turned out that there's all these people who have minute details of life that they um, express through aggression whether it's um, in how they speak or how they choose to behave with each other. So yeah, and also the idea of the power differential, you know, I, I know some power differentials have to exist, but it's the abuse of it that um, really came out in my stories. I'm like, oh, okay, I really don't like all, a lot of this stuff. So mm -hmm. I had a friend who read my stuff and he said, you know, not all men are bad. <laughs> I was like, I wasn't writing with that point of view that men suck, but um, it just turned out to be a big theme in my stuff. So. <laughs> awesome. I, yes, I have had that same thing pointed out to me as well about, about men. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I think I kind of went through similar processes as Far and Danielle in that it was, um, it was pretty organic in that I didn't kind of sit down with a concept and then write stories in that direction. But I had worked on, I'd written two novels um, and no, knew that I very much wanted to be back in the space of the, to take shelter and recover um, in the space of the short story after that. Um, and so at a certain point I printed out, but I had been writing short stories just um, you know, along, along the way over the course of working on those two longer projects. And so I sat down and I printed out 
like every story that I had written since my last collection came out and I had 400 pages of stories. Uh, and I was like, okay, no, nobody wants a 400 page story collection of that, I am sure. Um, but also like not all the stories talk to each other. Um, I love what Danielle said earlier about um, this idea like one really wonderful thing about a collection is that you can see a writer um, approaching um, this maybe sort of circling the same question and answering it in different ways and not not all the stories were you know interested in the same sorts of questions and answers and so I did kind of like a calling um, down to a group of stories that I thought had like thematic sort of resonance with one another um, and then I wrote like three or four, I wrote, a, I then was at a residency for a summer and wrote a lot of stories and like, I think three or four of them ended up going in the collection and having those like new, new stories really helped sort of hone the entire project. But um, I mean, I think as a reader, one of the things that I love the most about a story collection is that it is like, it's like enters into a world. And even if the stories aren't connected, in, in a super explicit way, right? Like by place or character or something like that. Um, there's a sense of the story as being united by a sensibility um, of being a world with its sort of own like aesthetics and tonality and rules, um, but also like getting to kind of travel the spectrum of that world and to see um, and to see the different the, the different kind of corners of it and to see the world be um, approached and examined uh, in different ways. And so, yeah, I love that about a, a collection, the way it has the possibility to hold this like great sort of variance and abundance in that way, by, while also having this kind of coherence of like voice and vision um, and tone and atmosphere. Great. Um, well, I mean, I feel like it's natural to move from that to, to, to sharing some samples of your work and reading them aloud so the folks in the audience can get a taste of like what's in these collections. So I was going to ask you, Danielle, to start off with a brief um, selection of something that's in Office of Historical Collections, Corrections. Uh, sure. Um, I usually read from the very beginning of the book, but I'm gonna I'm gonna vary it just in case anyone is super loyally following me to every event and you'll do the same thing over and over again. Um, I'm gonna read the beginning of the last um, story in the collection, which is a little bit of a cheat because it's actually a novella, but because it's the beginning, you don't need to know much more about it. The Office of Historical Corrections. Our office was tucked away in a back corridor of one of the, the city's labyrinth brutalist buildings, all beige concrete and rows of square windows. I had never minded DC's lingering architecture. I had been in college before I understood I was meant to find it ugly and not cozily utilitarian. But I had grown up with the architecture, grown up idealizing people who worked in buildings like mine. And besides, I like to remember that the term brutalism came not from any aesthetic assessment, but from the French for it, raw concrete. Since starting at the Institute, I had formally corrected mistaken claims about the term's etymology seven times. Small corrections usually made me feel pitiful and pedantic, but I liked making that one, liked to think of us, not just the people in my office, but all of the city's remaining civil servants, as people trying to make something solid out of what raw material we had been given, liked to think that we were in the right setting to do our jobs. Of course, as a field agent, I rarely spent a full day indoors. Often that freedom felt like a luxury, but it was June, not quite the worst of summer, but hot enough that walking my regular daily rounds left me flecked with sweat and constantly looking for excuses to go indoors. Some days I went to shops full of kitchen, corrected souvenirs with their dates wrong just to absorb the air conditioning. After everything else, I would remember how often I had been bored at the beginning of that summer, how worried I was that our work had become inconsequential, how I had wondered whether I would ever again be part of anything that mattered. That's great. So, I mean, that's just a taste, but what I wanted um, Farah and Laura to comment on is, I mean, you guys might have gotten little glimpses of it from, from Danielle's selection, but, you know, what do you guys think makes a story or a novella, a Danielle Evans short story or novellas? Like, what are some of the unique things that you tell other readers when you're recommending her work to others? I, I mean, so I love this book so much and also your previous collection. Um, I think like 
So, I mean, so many things. Like, I think, um, Danielle, that you are an absolute um, master of the craft of the short story in all ways. But I think one thing that I feel like, and I think this is true for your stories also, Farah, um, the, your ability to write into, like, character. I think particularly, like, when I sort of go through the Rolodex of Daniel Evan short stories, like the thing that I remember is the, that comes to me the first is, is character. And I think that your command of characters that are complicated, but also complicated in like unexpected ways, like it's like very often, and I love the title novella especially, but like very often when I feel like I have a sense of what a character's trajectory is sort of going to look like, um, something sort of swerves in this in this amazing way and then in in the aftermath of the swerve I'm like oh of course of course like of course it had to be that way but in the moment it's that like beautiful collision of this sort of like the the surprising and and also this kind of tidal pull of inevitability and I I mean I think another example of that is um uh, in um, Boys Go to Jupiter, which is like like a really challenging, um, yeah, character in that story. And I think like, I was so surprised by where that story sort of took me and the unexpected um, dimensions that it pulled me into in, in respect to character. And like the, like what it sort of um, compelled me to kind of feel and experience and think about as, um, as a reader. So yeah, that's, that's my, my, all right, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I when I read Danielle's stories in this collection, it was like the language was luxuriant and it was like being given a seat at a family table. And you know, you're invited to watch this really intimate moments from all your lives, really important ones, you know. Um, but it felt like the characters were always layered so well. It wasn't black and white. Oh, especially in the story that Laura mentioned, Boys Go to Jupiter, it was fantastic. Uh, you know, there was like a whole backstory of what she had been dealing with. But that makes you think on multiple levels, is that okay? How does that feed into her choices later on? You know, was it inevitable that she chose to do what she did, not giving any spoilers here for people? But <laughs> it was great. I loved it. It was like sinking deep into her work. It was awesome. Thank you both. Um, <laughs> I make my students do I this. I feel like everyone should read Boys each other. <laughs> and it's always like, they're always like, this is excruciating not to say the nice things, but to listen to them. And I'm like, oh, I feel pity for my students. It's like, it's, it's excruciatingly wonderful to hear people say nice things about your work. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, can you share something from my hold a wolf by the ears? Sure. Um, so I am going to read um, the first couple of paragraphs of a story called Slumberland. I'm in my hometown in Florida right now and that's where this is set. So um, here we go. I spent that summer driving around at night and taking photographs because I could not stand the sound of my neighbor wailing through the walls. This neighbor lived in the apartment above me, and when I passed her in the stairwell, she looked perfectly regular, but at around 10 o'clock at night, she would start carrying on, and her uncorked sadness had a physical effect on me. My skin itched, my teeth ached, a clear liquid leaked from one of my eyes. Once, I even got a nosebleed. I wondered if our other neighbors could hear her, and if anyone had knocked on her door or called building management to complain. I did not knock on her door or call building management to complain because I did not want to confront whatever was happening in my neighbor's apartment. I wanted only to get away. The apartment complex I was fleeing was north of Orlando, situated between the Deltona Lakes and the Seminole State Forest. My life there seemed provisional, even though I had no immediate plans to move, and so it felt natural to wander. As I drove around looking for things to photograph, I added up what little I knew about my neighbor. She had lived in the apartment complex for six months. I did not know her first name, but from the mailboxes, I knew her last, Novak, unless that name was left over from the people who had lived there before, which was possible. Until this wailing situation, I had not paid particularly close attention to the mailboxes. 
The neighbor had a shoulder tattoo that spelled out something inscrutable in dainty cursive lettering. I often passed her hauling swollen bags from Dollar Tree up and down the stairwell. I had no idea what she did for a living. We had never really spoken, just waves and nods. She used to have a cat, but a few months after she moved in, the cat vanished. I remember seeing signs in the laundry room, a photo of a black and white cat, the offer of a meager reward. Things my neighbor did not know about me. I have taken photographs all my life. My first camera was a Kodak. I used to make my living as a wedding photographer, but after moving into the apartment complex, I migrated over to pet portraiture. There was a surprising amount of money to be made in photographing German shepherds in bow ties. Plus, no one ruins their life by getting a dog. I will stop there. <laughs> Yeah, same question for you, um, Farah and Danielle, about how you describe um, Laura's work, or like, how do you know a story if you didn't see that who wrote it is the Laura Vanderberg story? Yeah, I mean, I think that Laura's work always has for me this wonderful tonal quality where that, that sort of work of defamiliarization, whether we're in just a kind of run of the mill day or in a world where the rules of our world don't apply. Um, I feel like there's like an equal level of strangeness, right? Like she manages to make, make feeling alive feel strange in the way that it feels to be alive, even if sort of nothing supernatural is happening. And then also can like make it feel seamless that the world can suddenly break a rule or we, we understand the world building differently. Um, I've said before that I think that conversation we were having about time and compression earlier that Laura is a sort of masterful about time that often there's just this tiny glimpse of the future or the past but it's exactly the right sort of thing that recasts the whole story um, and I think it's very hard to have a very small flash forward those can feel really clumsy or didactic and Laura always has exactly the right sort of glimpse of the future and exactly the right amount and it just sort of, sort of takes your breath away and, and changes the story. I don't know, I mean, I think it's, I, I've said to Laura before that I feel like if every time I read a Laura Van Edinburgh story, like emotionally, I feel like, oh, I could have written this because I like feel the feeling, but then intellectually I feel like I never could have written this because it's so like singular and specific um, and, and complicated and, and doing this amazing thing. And I think that that's sort of the tonal space of her work for me that you sort of really feel the beating heart of it, but it's also just so, smartly and interestingly and specifically constructed in the world. Yeah, I found her stories um, eerie and unsettling, you know, they had this, I don't know how it was because of the careful quality of like the sentences, the length of the sentences or, and, and you, you tried a lot of different things. There was compression in the, the Hill of Hell story, you know, the, like a whole lifespan. And there was repetition in another one. Um, but the whole effect was that of feeling untethered from this world. And like Danielle said, it was like you're kind of parallel to normal life. And you do relate. I related to every single thing, to a lot of things that I saw in those stories. And, you know, I managed to feel angry on the behalf of a lot of those women there. <laughs> and uh, it was amazing, this feeling of they are so on the edge. What's going to make them go over the edge, you know, uh, and there were mostly external factors. So that was the angry part, um, because a lot of times they were forced to behave in ways that maybe they couldn't help. Um, but it never came across as, um, what do you call it, didactic, like Danielle said, preachy, you know, it was, it was um, very unsettling. Awesome. Thank you both so much. <laughs> I, I will. <laughs> I will hold these words close the next time I'm having like some sort of crisis, <laughs> which will be probably like about three to four hours from now. <laughs> Farah, can you read some of your work, most recent work too? Yeah, I can read um, <clears throat> something. Our sister from a story called Present Tense. It was in Copernicle a few years ago. I'm just going to read the start of it. What I remember most from childhood is a time when my father did not come home one day and not the next day, nor the day after. I was 12 then and my brother was 15. 
In the first few days of his absence, I used to wake up in a state of anxiety, my body filling up with the unpleasantness of this great uncertainty my brother, my mother, and I were thrust into. I felt better among the wooden lidded desks in my classroom and the faces of my teachers. And by afternoon recess, I was at the peak of my day's happiness. In the evening, at six o'clock came nearer, the time my father usually came home, I was paralyzed with worry and could only sit in a corner of the living room, only able to move again when the hour hand came to rest on seven. After a strange meal with my shrunken family, I used to sink into sleep, grateful that my father was still gone and uncomfortable with myself for feeling this way. I, used to be I wanted to be assured of his staying away longer, but didn't know how to talk to my mother about him. Besides, my brother was already doing the asking. She gave him a different answer each time. He's visiting relatives, or he needs to be at work, or he comes home late and goes to work before you wake up. One evening, she was humming and sorting out a pile of old books, and maybe that made my brother wonder if she had killed our father. His face turned red, and he shouted at her and called her selfish. She paused in her task and said, sharp as ice, your father is perfectly fine. She always called him your father when she was angry and wanted to hold us, his sons, responsible for his presence as if our births made him a necessary evil in her life. And when she said those two words that night, I felt twisted with sadness because I thought that with him gone, she would like her sons better. My brother stomped away, but I stood a while longer, watching her face anxiously. I felt light only when she started to hum again. Awesome. Same question for you, Laura and Danielle, about Farah's work. What stands out to you about it or, or what kind of characterizes her work as her own? Um, I think, so I love that story, especially. And um, I think that, I think if your stories is working like so beautifully in the aftermath space, um, which is a kind of like such a like dynamic and complex sort of space to situate characters in. And I think you realize that that space so, so beautifully. And I, I guess like, I mean, time has come up a few times. I love to talk about time in fiction. It's one of my like favorite subjects. Um, but I think like, Farah, you do amazing things with time. And in this story, I, I, again, not to like, not to give too much away, but just suffice it to say that we, move into the future and there's kind of an unexpected um uh the unexpected information is revealed or we find ourselves maybe in an unexpected place and then the story kind of cuts back into the past in really interesting ways and i found this story like the way that you manage time in the story it was so um it was so suspenseful, you know, and we don't always think of suspense as being like the province of the short story and maybe think of that more with novels. But I, yeah, I remember feeling like I was like turning the pages so quickly um, because I really wanted to understand the gap between sort of the past representations and like how, how it had given way to this sort of present reality that we're finding ourselves in. But I think the, the like the handling, um, the like complex, like surprising handling of time and also to go back to the idea of like so many of your stories kind of dwelling in the space of aftermath, like really illuminating the different ways that characters respond to crisis. Um, I'm thinking of like the brothers in this story, both in the, um, in the past and the present, like their responses to what happens are really different. And the way that that can sort of like shatter relationships and kind of create like aftermaths within the aftermath. Um, but also it can, those like different sort of understandings can and different narratives can also create um, a connection in surprising ways. So yeah, those are, those are some things that come to mind. Yeah, I think the sort of the psychology of your storytelling is really beautiful. Um, I think a lot of us work in this space between people's inner lives and their exterior lives. And I think you, you, you do that really beautifully, but you also are really, great at the space where someone is just sort of saying the thing directly or inhabiting the feeling directly, which is sometimes actually harder to get on the page in a way that feels graceful and complicated. But those sort of moments when, um, like in, in the passage you just read where he says, sometimes I was glad my father wasn't there, you said it better than that. But those sort of moments when someone just has a feeling and can inhabit that feeling directly without the performance or pretense, um, somehow you manage to get them on the page in this way that sort of really feels, um, 
completely straightforward and no less complicated for how straightforward it feels. I also think that you can sort of see the psychology of your characterization in the physical world and like your attention to detail and description and the way that people notice or don't notice things when they're in crisis or when they're distracted. I feel like I get a really concrete sense of the surrounding world from your stories, um, but I get it through the lens of a particular character's eye and I get as much of it as makes sense to get. Oh, thank you, that's really kind words. <laughs> I'm gonna sleep happy after this. Hopefully soon it's like 4 a.m. with that. I know. Well, it's almost five now. Oh no. <laughs> almost daylight. <laughs> um, I love the idea of having all three of you in conversation with one another because I think your work is extraordinary memorable. Like all of these stories that I've read by each of you haunt me in some way or another. And also like, I think your work is extraordinarily badass. And by that, I mean, like it always like takes risks is surprising. Um, you know, you go places that other people might not go. And, and, and again, as I mentioned before, you all have a style that is really unique and your own. Um, and so I was just curious about the process by which you came to develop the authentic voice that you have today and like what that looked like. I mean, along the way, I'm sure there were people who said, no, write novels or don't be so dark or be nicer to men or white people or black people or Muslim. And like, how did you kind of steer your own way through all that feedback to develop the authentic voice that you've brought to your work that we're discussing today. I'm an only child and a November Scorpio and I just I don't know how to have any other voice. <laughs> like I, I wish that I had like a journey of like and then I found myself but honestly like I just I don't know how to sound like anyone else or do anything I don't really want to do or feel like I care about. Um, I, mean, I do think that, you know, there's always a process of discovery and your voice can change on you. And sometimes I think that's the more surprising thing is that, um, you know, the stories in this book, even though like obviously there are topics and questions and stylistic things that I return to in both collections, the stories in this book have a really different shape, I think, than the stories in my first book. And I had to sort of let that happen instead of trying to force myself to rewrite the same thing over and over again. But, um, but I don't know, I think, I think it it would be harder for me to try to do something else than to, than to just sort of find the voice that comes most naturally. That's awesome. I I am a since we've opened the astrology door, Emma Emma Gemini, Moon Lake and Aquarius Moon. I I have like the if I am not innately like really deeply interested in something, I have the attention span of like a goldfish. Um, but if something like really holds my attention, um, you know, then the, my, it can, my energy for it can be bottomless. But I think, yeah, the idea of like, I, I mean, I, I'm always like so amazed when I hear someone who's really like, I finished this draft of the novel. I mean, I didn't really want to write the novel, but my agent told me I had to. I'm like, <laughs> literally, <laughs> how did you <laughs> yeah, manage to like get all of those words down? I mean, I just wouldn't have like the, like the wherewithal to do that. Um, at the same time, I mean, I do think that I have struggled with fear in some ways in um, just in my creative practice, like um, with my first novel, there were huge chunks of it that I held on to, like whole subplots. I in 2011, I got every bad idea that I've ever had and put them in one book. Um, like I had like like there were like five terrible subplots that so clearly needed to be um, excised from the project. But I also had spent so much time on them, um, right? Like I had sunk so much time into them, and I kept telling myself like maybe if I keep sort of like massaging them or tweaking them or working on them, um, they, can, they, can, they can have a life, a meaningful life in the book, even though when I read them over, you know, I would always get the same sort of queasy feeling. And then, you know, when I eventually like got the courage to um, cut those parts, I felt this like immediate sort of physical lateness and it was indeed absolutely the right thing to do. But it took me way too long just because like I was scared. Um, I'd spent a lot of time working on this draft. I didn't know if I cut this, would the draft sort of survive? Would I figure out, you know, what was going to go in its place? Um, and I had, this is going to seem like a 
in a classic Gemini move, this is going to seem like a non sequitur and a sort of swerve in a different direction. Um, Nate, oh, Danielle and I have a, a mutual friend named Nate. And when hey. Nate and I are together, who's also a Gemini, we like will in, in a span of 10 minutes, we will start and not finish like 30 different conversations. But I promise I'm not going to do that <laughs> here. Um, but one of the other great loves of my life um, is from, uh, it, apart from literature, is boxing. And I really, when I started sparring, I struggled with fear, like still struggle with fear sometimes. And um, I started reading interviews with a lot of like sort of boxing legends. And I expected them, I expected them to talk about like how they were fearless, right? Because it would seem like that you would have to be. Um, and instead, so many of them talked about fear and like the intensity of the fear and how they felt it like every moment that they were in the ring. Um, but they also talked about like kind of learning to sort of like listen to fear and work with fear. And instead of trying to just ignore it and like eliminate it um, from your being, learning to make fear kind of like a teacher. Um, and that's something that I, I've thought about so much since then, because I I think my my fear like was trying to it was trying to show me something it was trying to get me to pay attention to something but I was also kind of unwilling to like really sit with it right I, I didn't want to sit with it I just wanted to like keep going keep going forward and so I think that that's that's something I think about a lot um, in my work and I, I didn't get to a point in a project where I think about like if you were if you could kind of work with this fear like what would yeah what would what would you do differently what would you feel like you had you had permission to to do yeah um about the finding the voice thing i think it might my when i think back to if i had any problem or you know i didn't think about finding a voice because i just wrote because i hadn't written for so long and so it was all i think it was just building up in my head so, you know, second person, third person, whatever. Um, I just got it all out there. But um, uh, as far as the Muslim thing is concerned, I don't think it was a problem, uh, but I am very, very impatient. So when I wasn't getting published earlier, you know, just like five years, four years ago, I thought I should change my name <laughs> as a submitter. And, uh, and then, but you know, then things changed and I was like, oh, okay, that was just in my head. Um, and with the collection as well, when I was sending it out to agents and stuff, and I got some lukewarm responses and some good responses that did ask me, do you have a novel? And I said, I don't. Um, back then I didn't. But, and again, when a lot of queries turned like dead, I thought maybe I should just call it Muslim girl from Pakistan, you know, and they're just going <laughs> to snap it up. You can see the copy practically right itself. So. But then again, uh, I think that was more my, my more cynical moments. Um, so I don't think anybody asked me to dial up or down the Muslim thing. But again, I haven't really talked about it in an obvious way. You know, my characters are what they are. Um, yeah. And so the voice thing comes to me without dwelling too much on, are they Muslim? Are they this? What do they practice? What do they wear? Um, what do they look like? They just are. And a lot of times I don't name my places. Um, if I could, I wouldn't name the names <laughs> just to make it hard. Um, yeah, and just keep it to the voice itself. Great. I have one more question for you guys and then I'm gonna open it up to audience questions. But, um, you know, I feel like another thing that you guys all have in common of doing really well is is on the one hand, like creating these really deeply affecting human personal characters with inner lives, but that are also, you know, um, interacting with an outside world, which is very much reflective of, you know, all of the things that we see today, whether it's, you know, um, sexism, classism, racism, power differentials, we talked about that, like, how, um, how conscious are you, you, how conscious are you in the drafting process of wanting to write characters who, who both have these, these private and public um, lives and identities, or is that just something that comes natural because that's so much a part of, of who we are? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any way to write a character who feels fully alive who doesn't have some awareness of the difference between their inner life and outer life. And I mean, that goes for any kind of character, no matter what their background is. But I think the more privilege you have, sometimes the fewer things you have to think about or not even necessarily as a marker of privilege. I mean, sometimes an exercise I do with my students is to imagine asking different fictional characters from for directions from point A to point B, right? Like what 
who assumes you have a car, who gives you walking directions, who gives you bus directions, right? Who assumes you know how public transit works and who assumes that like, you need instructions? Who, who thinks one block is safer and who thinks another block is safer? Who thinks about safety at all? You know, like, I think just the way that we relate to the physical world is so much about the way that we've been, the way that we've sort of learned to inhabit it and our, and our sense of kind of structural power. And I think in any relationship between characters, part of the question I'm asking is who has the power to make a person perform? And sometimes that's a very human intimate thing just in terms of how the characters relate to one another. Sometimes that's a structural understanding, right? Who has actual power in this relationship? Um, who has to be afraid or conscious of an external gaze or conscious of like when they'll be not hurt or misunderstood or punished. Um, and I think all of those things feel to me less like topical questions and more like the sort of questions you think about every day as you consciously or not negotiate the world. And the question is more like, when do they need to be conscious questions in the story? And when are they just sort of part of the, the texture? Like when does a character need to actually observe or explain why they're thinking about something in a particular way or, or how they're thinking about a space or a relationship or a power dynamic? And when is it just part of the, the story um, that people can intuit? Yeah. Great, Laura Farr, do you want to answer that one? Um, yeah, I don't consciously think about that because I think it comes into the stories anyway. And though I think, no, I can't really remember my stuff right now for some reason, <laughs> because it's 5 a.m. <laughs> but uh, generally I don't write with the aim to show something obviously, but I think power differentials exist in so many ways in the form of different kinds of privileges, um, not just uh, you know, economic, but also who grew up with a lot of love or who grew up with a lot of um, um, comfort of making decisions uh, and, and being expected to listen to. So, and also who grew up with like, I don't know, sound mental health. So yeah. conversely, the person on the opposite side of them and they're always like, you're all, we're always in relationship with all these kinds of people. Um, so to show that the person who doesn't have the power, you know, that seeps into, I think, all my stories somehow without consciously thinking about it. Yeah. 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 I mean, I also think about sort of that relationship between the private self and the public self and that, um, and selves really, right? Like that's like, it's a, it's a layered thing, um, for, you know, for most people and for most characters. And I, I do tend to think of characters like, like we are, you know, constantly sort of ne negotiating the world in these, in these myriad ways. Um, I, I was interested in, um, I mean, a lot of the characters in my stories live sort of secret or covert lives in a way. Um, and they encounter people in the midst of their own secret and covert lives. And I've, I've long been interested in, the private self in that regard, sort of like the midnight version of oneself, um, you know, where it's like, if you meet someone on an empty road at midnight, it's like, you're not quite the same people that you are if you meet that same person on the road in the middle of the day. And, and what, is, what is this sort of covert moment open up or make available? Um, I, I was also really interested in some stories in, in kind of looking at the, um, <laughs> the sort of political selves that a character performs versus the the kind of like messier like uglier in, in the case I'm thinking specifically of a story called Lizards where it's a conversation between a husband and a wife and it's set um, in the backdrop of the Kavanaugh trials and it turns out the husband even though he can kind of perform um, you know what might be considered sort of acceptable liberal perspectives has been doing some like really important stuff um, but there's a moment where he talks about like the um, you know he wore like a deal me in um, you know shirt to the polls and uh, for the 2016 election so you know he's not like He's like, hey, like I'm not, you know, a Trumper. And nevertheless, 
um, yeah, there, there's a really big, you know, I could kind of imagine like what his Twitter, Twitter feed would look like. <laughs> He'd be like mansplaining stuff to a lot of people, I, I think, but, um, but, you know, but there's, there's a really enormous gap between this, this, the kind of political um, presentation and, and the kind of private self. And I think also for his wife to a certain degree, it's like, she's very angry um, and her anger is real, but it's also like, kind of like, but, but what will it, what would she be willing to change in her own life to make Kavanaugh less possible? Um, what would she be willing to give up? What would, what, what sort of, what, what, like she's benefiting from some of these structures too, just like as a white woman, what would she, what would she be willing to shift or change or sort of reevaluate? And, you know, I think in my understanding of her character, like when we meet her, the, the answer is maybe, you know, not that much. So it's the question of like, you know, her anger is understandable, but also like, is it ultimately kind of like ornamental, you know, where it will like fade and something else will take its place when this moment passes. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I, I was interested, yeah, in, in some of these stories. That Allie, can at, you shut that down? Um, shut that yeah. down. No worries. The um, yeah, the the pri that private self and and public self in like in a couple different ways. Um, I have a question from Anne English here that I'm going to read to you guys. Where did the seeds for your stories most often come from? Place or a snippet about a character? Um, is there a common well that you return to return to for inspiration to begin an individual story? Um, I can, I can start. I mean, for me, it's just, it's all kinds of things. I don't, true to my air sign temperament, like I'm, I'm, I'm like habit averse in some ways. So it's not, stories don't always start in the same place for me. I mean, sometimes it is, um, sometimes it's like, like, uh, like observ observational, um, like one day, you know, recently I saw a woman like by a construction site where there were just some like shovels staked outside in the dirt and she just like stopped, wow. picked up a shovel, put it over her shoulder and like biked on. And, you know, I, like, I thought about her for a while. I was like, where is she going with that shovel? Like, what does she plan to do with it? Is she gardening? Is she burying <laughs> someone? Um, I have no idea. Um, but it, but it, it's, it certainly, you know, got me, got me wondering. So sometimes it's, it's a sort of observational moment like that. Um, sometimes it's, it's sort of like an idea or more of a concept conceit driven story. Um, sometimes it's a sense of sort of atmosphere, uh, but I put a lot of stuff down in my notebook and probably less than half of it actually like evolves into a story. I think for me, you know, passing sort of interest and curiosity is, is important to be alert to and it's important for me to record it, but like something else, something deeper um, or more kind of dynamic has to kind of kick in at a certain point for me to feel like compelled to begin writing the story of the woman and the, the shovel, for example. Her midnight shovel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, for me, the ideas could be from anywhere. Generally, it's, it's like a thought that starts brewing in the head uh, or a mood uh, more often. And, um, or something I heard someone say, or a lot of times it's also news stories, you know, uh, things that are happening to people. And not in the, in not the tabloids either. <laughs> it's like the regular stuff that happens. Um, so yeah, and, but like like Laura said, I am always writing notes. You know, like I have a draft file, and it's crazy. I go back to it. I'm like, this makes no sense at all. Uh, you know, um, but anyway. So yeah, anything could spark off an idea. Even reading something else could spark off a thought for a story. I think for me, the ideas tend to come together into story when two of those random observations or thoughts, which might be image, might be character, might be sentence, might just be like a weird thing that I saw somehow feel connected to me. Like, like I write the story into that connection when somehow things that don't seem like they're obviously in conversation, somehow like the woman with the shovel and some random thing I overheard on the bus feel to me like they're in the same story, even though they were different events when my brain starts filling in the, the connective tissue there, or like I have this sort of strange image and I have a line of dialogue and somehow I have to like fit them together, but it starts to feel like a puzzle and not just an image. That's when I usually am in a kind of story place. 
And just to follow up to that from another audience member, how do you guys know when your stories are done? I mean, is there a point where like a bell, you know, a bell goes off and like this one is done or do, are you still revising them after they've been accepted for publication in a journal say, and then you get them together for a collection? How, what does that look like for you guys? I knew a story is done when it has tried to kill me and then lost. <laughs> I do, I mean, I think that you know, when I'm working on a draft, it's it's less, I mean, I am trying to get to the end of the story. I'm trying to get to the resolution of the plot question. But what I'm really waiting for is the moment where the story surprises me and sort of whatever is underneath it comes to the surface and tells me what's actually going on and what I've actually written. And that's usually just the end of the first draft, but that's the sort of real moment of revelation. And then I can revise because then I sort of know what I have to keep submerged and that I need to bring it to the surface at enough times to sort of let the story have feeling. Um, and I can sort of shape the story around that understanding of it. And I think once I get to the end of a first draft, I ask myself kind of what the story's operating questions are. Did I close the question I meant to close and did I leave open the questions I meant to leave open? Um, and sometimes it's a really long revision process and sometimes depending on how long I took on the first draft, it might be a shorter revision process, but I start with structure and then I read for sentence and, um, and then I feel like by the time I've gotten past the sort of sentence level revisions because I've already done the structure and character work, I can usually let the story go unless it's been so long that suddenly I understand the story differently, which occasionally happens. Yeah, I don't know that I really believe in doneness in a kind of broader <laughs> philosophical way. I, I think at a certain point, yeah, when it's tried to kill you and failed um, and you're like, and now I will rest. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I just say, you know, and it, it's, if, I mean, the, the, I, I would never go back and read, um, a book I published some time ago, because it just seems like an unkindness to myself. Um, but I suspect that if I were to do that, I would probably want to like, you know, start hacking at the pages with a red pen, because I, I would things would be perceivable to me that weren't perceivable to me at the time the work was written. And, and I mean, I think that that's something that we kind of have to make some peace with. It's like a book is, you know, it is, it is sort of as complete a vision of this particular thing that we could have at this specific moment in time. Um, and it doesn't mean that we won't sort of feel differently about it at a different moment in time. So, yeah. So, I mean, I think that, but I think it's it's that yeah that feeling of having survived the story, um, and and also you know um, a wonderful writer named Catherine Lacey has she had this great quote that I read in an interview. She talked about doneness a bit like um, making a sauce, um, and she's like you know if you're making like a tomato sauce right and you you've made you made a lot of sauces um, that you you can kind of go by taste and you you taste it and you're like okay it needs more acid it needs more heat it needs more salt whatever and she was like for stories it's kind of like that for her and i thought that that was actually a great metaphor that i think is as we get to know ourselves better as writers um we we can kind of read a draft and know that just intuitively that like the submerged thing has not yet been like fully excavated or, um, you know, or that there, there's, there's a dimension of character for the protagonist maybe that hasn't been sort of fully fleshed out. And, it, and it's like the more stories we write, I think the stronger that kind of intuitive um, uh, signal gets. Um, and so, yeah, and kind of like, right, if you, if you made a lot of sauces, you can sort of taste it. And if someone were to ask you to like quantify how the sauce was done, um, how you knew the sauce was done, it would probably be hard to say exactly. It would just be like, well, it tastes done. It tastes the way I want it to taste. And I, yeah, and I think in some ways it's not so different for stories. Yeah, um, you know, I was looking at the story I was gonna read today and I was like, oh, wow, he really says that? <laughs> Maybe I should change it. And that came out two years ago. But generally, I think because we're always changing, you know, our lives, our lives are changing, our situations are changing, we're growing as people all the time. So if you go back to a story, I think you will, your instinct will always tell you to tweak something or the other in it. But, you know, having said that, sometimes you really do feel the doneness of it. Like, this is it. This is as far as these people go, you know, or, you know, I, I'm, if you've sat with it for six months, then you're done with the story before it's done with you. And um, it could be either way, <laughs> whatever kills you first. <laughs> 
but generally a feel of the story and like Laura said the more you work on it the more the more you write the more you'll get a sense of the trajectory of a character story so yeah you guys I really appreciate you all spending your evening with us and maybe we can just um unspotlight Hannah if you don't mind so everyone can and can you, audience members you guys can put yourself um off, take yourself off mute they'll just give these guys a round of applause and thank you they were great um we really appreciate you being here thank you awesome <laughs> All right, take care. Good Thanks. night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.